So maybe put the view onto my hands so we can see what I'm doing. All right, so just quickly for a review. Let me know if the volume goes down. It usually goes down when I turn my hands. So quickly for a review. Um, I'm going to do the slip knot. We should all know how to do that. And quickly, I'm going to show you the cast on. I'm going to use the knitted on cast on. So you start out just like a knit stitch. And then instead of transferring the stitch over, we put the stitch back over on the left hand needle. And now I have two stitches. This is called the knitted on cast on. And it's a very nice one for beginners or for anyone really. It's good for lots of projects. So you start out as the knit stitch, you bring that stitch through, and then instead of transferring your stitch over as in knitting, you put this loop back over on the left hand needle. And that is gonna give you your cast on. And then you'll just cast on as many stitches as needed. So hopefully everybody has the pattern. Um, it's not really a pattern right now. It's more like an exercise we're going to be doing. Um, it, it instructs us that we should cast on 15. Rows one and two, we're going to work stockinette stitch. And stockinette stitch means you knit one whole side and you purl on the other side. So all of your knits will be on one side and all of your purls will be on the other side. So if you wanna start getting that started, I'm gonna talk a little bit about row three because row three, row three is kind of crazy. So RS means right side. So you'll be working on the knit side. It's telling us to knit seven, place marker, which is abbreviated PM, we're gonna KF and B, K1, M1, PM, and then K to the N. That sounds like a lot of crazy stuff, doesn't it? But we're gonna figure out how to do each one and we're gonna just do them one at a time. And as you work through them one at a time, it will be very easy and you don't have to be overwhelmed. So let's go ahead and start with row three and I'm gonna show you how we do that. So we're gonna start with knit seven and place marker. And just for the sake of saving time, I'm not going to cast on as many stitches as the exercise requests, just because you don't want to watch me purling back a whole bunch of stitches unnecessarily. All right, so I've already cast on my stitches. I've cast on just a few. And then instead of knitting seven, I'm just going to knit two, just so that we can get to the good stuff. You don't want to watch me knitting a bunch of stitches unnecessarily. And then when it says place marker, it's this easy. You take your stitch marker and you put it right on your right hand needle. And now I've placed my marker. And you keep the marker always in between these two stitches. And when you come back to that marker, you just slip it to the next needle so that it doesn't change places. And I'll show you how to do that. So we place marker and then we're going to K, F, and B. Now that sounds like a questionable activity, I don't know, but we're gonna figure it out. So K, F, and B is a, it's an increase. So we're gonna increase one stitch. So we're gonna take this stitch right here and we're gonna turn that stitch into two stitches. So we're gonna add one stitch. And it starts out very easy. You start out just like knitting. So you enter that stitch just like normal. You wrap your yarn and then you bring the loop through just like normal, everything's normal. And then here's where it gets a little different. So instead of just transferring that stitch over, what we're gonna do is we're gonna swing our needle back to this side and we're gonna look right here. So this is the back of the loop right here. So this is the front of the loop and that's where you usually work. But for this situation, we're gonna work through the back of the loop. So you can see how I went through the back of the loop 
And now once you've done that, it's pretty much like normal knitting. You wrap your yarn and you bring that through and then you transfer it over. And what happens is instead of one stitch, I have two stitches. When you use knit front and back of the loop, it creates this little bar under your stitch and it almost looks like a pearl bump. And everybody always thinks they've done something wrong, but that's how you know you did it right. If you see that, everything's right, okay? So, and then the directions say to knit one, which is nice to just do something normal. And now we're gonna make one. And I'm gonna demonstrate each one of these several times so you don't have to panic. So for making one, um, you wanna look for these bars that are in between your stitches. Now, when you're working on a real piece, you wouldn't wanna stretch it like this. It'll, it'll, it'll distort your fabric. But because I want you to see exactly where I'm going, you stretch it out like that just so we can see. And what you do is you take your left hand needle, you swing it, kind of point it back towards yourself, and then you go back and on the way back, you go under that bar and pick that loop up onto the tip of the needle. Now, anytime you have a loop of yarn going over your needle, it has the opportunity to become a stitch. And so that's good if you want it to, but if you don't want it to, then it's bad. So always be careful about looping yarn over your needle. But in this case, we're gonna create a new stitch. Now, if we knit just through the front loop like normal, what'll happen is that stitch will be very loose and it'll create a hole in your work. And you don't want that. So we're gonna knit this through the back loop. That will cause the stitch to twist. And Darren, sorry to interrupt. Hmm? Your video is a little bit blurry. Is it blurry? Yeah. I don't know if it's uh, a little bit better. I don't know if you need to refocus your phone screen or what. I'm sorry. Is that any better? A little bit better. So if I hold it close, is it more blurry up there? It gets a little more blurry when it's super close. Okay, I was just trying to make sure. That's, that's probably an okay spot. Okay, so let me back All up right. that. Let me get back to where I wanted. Okay, I'm going to start over with the make one. So you bring, you bring the needle towards you on the way back. You pick up that bar, and then we're going to knit through the back loop. So we're going to just go right there, so you can kind of see, right through there, and then wrap your yarn like normal, and then bring that through. And this is called make one. So it also increases your knitting by one. And we're going to add, place our marker, and then knit to the very end. And you'll, if you do this exercise, you'll have more stitches than I do because I'm just trying to save a little time. So any questions, I'm gonna be purling back and while I'm purling back, that might be a nice time for any questions. Okay, so if we're purling back, just like normal. When you come to those stitches, you just work them as normal. So here I want you to see how to slip the marker. It's so easy. You wanna make sure you're not knitting into this marker and knitting it into your work. So just make sure it's not knitted into your work. And then when you slip it, you just transfer it over just that easy. That the most, um, the most, mostly the things that people will do wrong in that situation is they will knit the stitch marker into their work. I've done, when I first was learning, I did that a couple of times. Okay, so almost there. So sometimes people will 
kind of do that. They kind of go through both and that'll knit it into your, so you want to make sure you're slipping it and it just moves all by itself with nothing else going with it. And then you're going to knit the last two and this, or purl the last two. I'm sorry, this is the purl side. And now we're back on, back on the right side where we're going to be doing most of our work. So what I'm going to do this row, I showed you how to work that row according to the directions. I'm going to do a whole bunch of the knit front and backs and the make ones kind of right in a row so that you can see them um, happening a couple of times. and Maybe that'll help reinforce what's going on. So I'm going to start off with my knit two. So I'm going to kind of abandon the pattern for a little bit. So knit two. And I want you to see how you slip the marker. You just slip it over so easy. And so now I'm going to do a knit front and back. And so if you need, if you don't understand this, let me know where you're losing it and we'll try to demonstrate it more clearly. So you start out just like normal. You enter the stitch, wrap the yarn, bring it through, and then you're going to swing this needle back and you're going to find the back part of the loop and so you're just going to go through that the back of the loop wrap your yarn bring it through transfer it over so now i have two stitches where there was just one so i'll do that again enter the stitch wrap your yarn Bring that loop through just like normal. And then you're going to go back. And so see at this point, you can kind of see that back loop right there. So you're going to go back, pick up that back loop and knit it. Bring it through. It's a, it feels a little tricky the first time you do it. Transfer it over. Enter the stitch, wrap the yarn bring it through. Now what happens sometimes when people are doing this, they get nervous or they're, they're stressed out and they tend to pull it very tight. And then when they get back here, this, this loop is pulled so tight, it, it's hard to get in. Like you can hardly do it. Sometimes you can't even find it. So if you find that, that it's very tight and that you can't really even find it, then take a second and then just loosen it up. Just move some of the slack from the front to the back and then that'll give you plenty of room. So I've seen a lot of students do that. So just kind of give yourself a little extra slack if you find that's happening, and it'll be very easy. Okay, so that's knit front and back. And then you can see one, two, three. There's three little bumps, which is created when we do the knit front and back. And that's kind of a tattletale that tells you that's where that happened. So you know you did it correctly. Are there any questions about that? Any part of that where it looked confusing? You were apparently psychic and answered Diana's question about it being tight before she even asked it. So good mm -hmm. job. Yes, um, I, am just... a bit, I am a bit psychic, so <laughs> there's that. And just a reminder, that was the demonstration of the knit front and back. I can yes. always tell because it's gonna have that little bitty pearl bump where you added the new okay. stitch. And I'm going to show you how that can be beneficial later on. All right, so next we're going to do make one. And I'm going to just knit one stitch because I don't want to do it right where we did the knit front and back. And then you just transfer your marker over. It's that easy. So now for the make one. And let me know if this goes out of focus again. So I try to bring it close so that it's easy to see. So you want to find that bar. You take your left hand needle and you bring it towards yourself. You kind of point it at yourself. And then on the way back, you go under that bar and pick it up. All right, and then you can see how big that is. If I were to just knit right through there, it would create a big hole in your work. So we don't want that. So you have to pick it up through the back. And it's the same situation here, and it might even be more here, I've seen where students pull it tight and then they go back there and there's like, there's not even a loop back there. Like, what am I supposed to do?
but you've got all of this stretched here. So if, look how you can just give it some slack. And then now when you go back here, see how there's plenty of room, makes it very easy. Wrap your yarn and bring it through. And this does create a twisted stitch. Um, it kind of blends in, so it doesn't matter. If you did a whole bunch of these in a row, you would probably see a different texture, but usually you don't do a bunch in a row. Like you wouldn't want to do another one on the same bar because that would distort your fabric. So I'm gonna knit one. And then here's my bar. So normally I would just go like this and that's all you really need to do to find it. So there's your bar. You don't want to stretch out and distort your fabric. So you take this needle, scoop it up, enter the back stitch, wrap your yarn, bring it through. And then there's another trick I'll show you if it feels really tight, how you can avoid it feeling so tight. Okay, so I'm going to pick up my bar. So sometimes I'll even like find it with this finger and then you can kind of use that to help you find it. Knit through the back loop. Okay, but if it feels super tight, one thing you can do is just bring it down to the tip of your needle because the tips are much thinner and that'll give you a little extra slack. So if it feels really tight, bring it down to the tip and that'll make it easier for you. But remember, after you shape this, you bring that through and you have to shape the stitch on the fattest part of your needle. You don't want to let them shape on the tip. Um, bring them back here and shape them on the fattest part of your needle and that'll help you with your gauge and keep everything consistent. Okay, so I'll make one more make one. See, so this time I was doing it like that. I was picking it up with that one and then because sometimes that's how I do it. But technically, I usually put my finger here to help it. Sometimes you're not looking at what you're doing. Sometimes you're feeling it with your, you're just feeling your way across. But there are different ways of accomplishing the same task. So if you find something that works, you can do it. So I'm teaching you best practices and then sometimes my hands revert to the way I kind of do it when I'm just seeing knitting on my own. All right, so then I finished that. And so just a little bit about the differences between them. So the make one doesn't have that little tattletale bum, but if you look at it, you can tell the difference. So this one was not a make one. And if you look and see how the stitch under that is shaped, it, it's not twisted or anything. It's shaped nicely, it may be a little loose. But if you look at the make one, if you look at the stitch right under it, you can see it's tight and it's a little twisted. It's like the legs of the stitch are crossed. So you, you know something kind of happened there. And then this one, you can see that it's a little tighter because we did the make one with it, but the stitches aren't crossed, they're open. Now the next one, you can see how they're crossed, they're not open. So that was where the make one was. Um, they're a little, they're almost invisible when you do them in your work, you really don't notice them very much. And then this one, of course, we talked about this little bump, which is the tattletale for that one. So remember, when you're doing the knit front and back, the KF and B, you're taking one stitch and turning it into two stitches. But when you're doing the make one, you're making a new stitch where there was no stitch. So that's why it's called make one, because you're just making up a new stitch where there was no stitch. So that's the main differences between them, okay? And they don't look much different from the back, really. You really can't tell too much on the back, anything happened. Any questions about that? Do we wanna move on to the increases? I'm sorry, the decreases? We had a couple questions about, uh, someone noticed that you were holding your yarn in your left hand and are the stitches done the same if you're holding your yarn in the right hand? Yeah, I can demonstrate that. They're always done the same. Um, you can hold your yarn in your left hand or your right hand. You just wanna make sure you're always approaching the stitch in this, from the same way. 
So let me I'll get across here and then I'll demonstrate. Yeah. And then someone asked, is the make one done differently in continental knitting? Um, not really. Um, you just pick up that stitch, you pick up that bar in between, you, um, you, and then you knit it through the back loop. However you knit, however you hold your yarn, you, it, it doesn't make any difference. You'll just pick that, you just knit it through the back loop. So that's the good thing about knitting. There's a lot of things that have to be done a certain way, but there are a lot of ways to do that thing. So lots of different variations. depending on how you learned. Uh, just to clarify that the knit front and back and the make one are both different types of increases. So yeah. there are different ways to achieve the same result of adding one stitch at a time. So let me hold it in the yarn in my right hand. And it's really gonna look the same. You'll be surprised. It doesn't really change this function at all. So I'm gonna knit two to my marker so I can flip my marker consistently because that's being forced back. Sorry. Actually put it in my right hand. Um, so I'm gonna do the knit front and back. So you enter the stitch, wrap the yarn, bring it through. Swing to the back, enter the stitch, wrap the yarn, bring it through, transfer it over. So it's really the exact same thing, just depending on how you're approaching it. It really doesn't change the structure of it or the way you do it. So same thing, wrap the yarn, bring it through, go to the back, wrap your yarn, Bring it through. Anything else? There we go. Um, oh, we had a flurry of questions here. Um, the make one, can you be done as a make one right or make one left? Good question. So, Claire, you might have to help me decide which one's which because being a dyslexic person, right and left mean nothing to me. So this is the one we talked about. I think this, is this make one right? That is make one left. The, and uh, this, yes. Being dyslexic, right and left mean nothing. <laughs> and if your pattern doesn't specify, it just says make one, you should assume that they're telling you to make one left because that's the default, default type of this increase. And so and with the one, the one we were describing, you bring the yarn, the needle toward you, and then you pick it up on the way back. For the make one right, you take the needle away from you towards the back of your work, pick it up this way. And so now you'd want to knit through the front of the loop. So you want to look and see which way the opening is the largest. So you wouldn't want to knit through the back of the loop, because that's going to give you a big hole. So you knit through the front of the loop. And the way I always remember it is that for the make one right, your needle has to come through to the right side of the fabric or the one that's facing you, but most often the right side. Well, that's true. That's a good way to remember. Yeah. And then Bev wondered, is a yarn over another form of increase? Yeah, I can show you a yarn over real quick. It's not really part of this exercise, but it does come in handy. Um, a yarn over adds a stitch, but it also creates a hole. So if you arrange these holes in the shape of a flower, now you're knitting lace. So that's pretty much, or you could do an, like an eyelet around the edge of a blanket. So this is how I, I've seen some very complicated ways of doing a yarn over, but this is how I always do mine and it seems to work perfect. So you take your right hand needle and you go, you just put the yarn over that needle. So that's the yarn over. And then you knit the next stitch, knit it, purl it, whatever the next instruction is. And then what happens is you've got this yarn going over your needle 
but it's not connected to anything under it. So it is going to create that hole. And um, when you come back, you'll just knit that, you'll come to that um, loop. And it'll seem a little weird because it, it is a little weird if you've never done it before. But you just knit or purl that or whatever the instruction is telling you, just like it's a normal stitch. Okay? But it is going to create that hole. Any other questions? Does a knit front and back have a right and left like the make one, or you do, do you just do it the same every time you make it? I have always just done it the same. Claire, what do you think? Have you, is there? Yep. yep. I mean, I suppose you could reverse it and knit into the back and then the front, but why make never it harder done. on yourself? Does it really lean differently? I've never done them. You might end up with a bump on the uh, the opposite side of the stitch. And so if you're using, you know, a long like a raglan increase in a sweater, you could have a decorative bump, you know, next to your center stitch. But I would have to sit and swatch that out. So I don't want to promise anything for sure. Well, I just did one. And it seems like the bump's still on the other side. Yeah, I mean, these are good ideas. You could totally practice it and see how it works. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna endorse it yet. I'm not gonna I'll speak against it, but I'm not really gonna endorse it. So we have to practice that. I love the, the question. These are great, these are brilliant questions. I've never even thought of that, so good job. Sometimes we can all learn together, it's fun. All right, do we wanna try some Decreases, or are we ready to go ahead, or do we have more questions? I think we had one last question, different versions from a couple of people. What's your favorite type of increase? I almost always do knit front and back just because it's easy, and I like my life to be easy, so I usually just do that. I find it the easiest. I don't mind the bump. I don't mind that little bump. Sometimes it upsets people, so they don't want to see the little bump. So you can, you know, choose whichever you want. If I'm doing like an Icelandic sweater where you're doing the increases like across the chest and there's a good chance that that bump will show, then I'll use the make one. But mostly I would just KF and B, be done with it. What do, what, what do you do, Claire? What do you like? I'm a little pickier than you and I tend to use make one left and or make one right, depending upon which side of like a marker I'm working on. Yes, but your sweaters are always perfect. So, you know. <laughs> Not perfect, but. They look perfect. So if you want perfect sweaters, listen to Claire. <laughs> All right. So now the next thing we're going to do, if we're ready to move on, is we're going to learn how to do some decreases. And the decreases, we're going to review two of those as well. And the first one we're going to learn is is SSK, and then we're going to learn K2TOG. Okay, so if you look here, and I'm not really following this exercise precisely because I don't want to bore you to death, so I'm just trying to get as much information as I can on each row. So the first one, if you follow this exercise, you're going to knit one, SSK, and that stands for slip, slip, knit. And then we're gonna K, which stands for knit. We're gonna knit to the three stitches before the end. So when we have three stitches left, we're gonna knit two together and then knit one. So K2, T-O-G stands for knit two together. And then usually on the wrong side of whatever you're making, there's not much activity. Usually on the wrong side, you will just purl back across. Most, almost always, the action and the fancy stitches take place on the right side. Do you find that to be true, Claire? I would say mostly, yes, mostly. until mm -hmm. you're getting into band. like complicated lace patterns. Yes. yes. Yeah. So mostly as a general rule. Okay. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate first the slip slip knit. So it's SSK. And this is a little different. You might not have done anything like this before. So you Can you move your, your hands down to the center of the screen just a little bit? Is that better? Yeah, that's good. 
that way we've got the dark background behind you. Okay, so you take your right hand needle and you enter your stitch as if to knit. So you enter that stitch as if you were gonna knit it, but then you don't, you just slip it over. And you enter the stitch as if to knit, but you don't, you just slip it over. So that stands for our slip slip. Now you take your left hand needle and you're gonna enter that in between, you're gonna enter both of those stitches. You're gonna keep your needle on the, on the front side that's facing you. So you enter both of those stitches. So you enter both stitches. Just through both stitches. And now at this point, your left hand needle is facing you and your right hand needle is on the bottom. And that's really, we didn't, we got there in a weird way, but that's really how our knitting normally looks. We normally enter the stitch and have the right needle on the bottom. So even though we got there in a weird way, this, this should look pretty normal to us. And then you wrap your yarn, just like normal, and then you're gonna bring that through both, and then you transfer it over. So what this does, it takes two stitches and it turns them into one. So you're losing one stitch. And then you can see that this, it kind of leans, so it's leaning towards the left, right? The left. Okay. So I'm gonna demonstrate this again. So I'm telling you to slip it as if to knit. So slip as if to knit. I wanna drill that into your memory, slip as if to knit. Because usually when you slip a stitch, almost always you slip it as if to purl. And the reason that is, is if you're slipping a stitch as if to purl, you slip it over and you do not twist it. But for this situation, we wanna twist it. So you slip it as if to knit. So you enter it as if to knit. Now watch what happens when I, when I switch it over. So this, this um, side of the stitch is facing like this orange marker. But watch what happens. See, it turns right around. So it twists right around and that's gonna give us the right shape for the stitch. So you twist it, you slip it as if to knit, and it kind of turns that stitch around. You enter, enter the stitch. Okay, sorry, I'm watching myself knit through my camera and my depth perception is off. So it's really kind of hard for me to see. And if I don't look through my camera, then I end up moving my hands away from the view. So that's not good for you guys. So we're, I'm working through it. And then you just wrap your needle, bring it through both, transfer it over. And then that gives you one more and leaning that direction. Are there any parts of that that you wanna see close up again or be just have described again? It's a little, it looks really crazy, but after you do it a few times, it's actually quite simple. So any more, any questions about that? We'll do it a few more times. Nope, we're all good. We're all good. I was gonna say you covered the uh, question about slip as if to knit or slip as if to purl, so. Yeah, I, I have taught this class enough that I usually know what questions are gonna come up. So I try to cover them as best I can. Okay, so now knit two together is very simple. So I have these two stitches here and I'm gonna knit them together. So normally when you knit a stitch, you just go right through here like normal, but we're not doing a normal thing. So we're gonna knit these two together. So we're gonna skip the first one. We're gonna go to the second one, but we're gonna enter both loops. We don't wanna miss that first one or we'll, or we'll have a drop stitch. So you go through both loops. And again, if it seems very tight, you can do your work on the point of the needle where it's more narrow. Give yourself a little slack. Wrap your yarn, pull that through both stitches, transfer it over. And if you were working down on the tips of your needles, make sure you push that up to the fattest part of your needle so that it doesn't make the stitch very small. Okay, so I'm gonna just 
knit one so we can get this marker and then slip the marker you just so easy you just slip it right over being careful see i kind of got that a little bit in so it's just being careful that it's not connected and then now i'm going to do another knit two together so there's one and two that's what i'm going to knit together you enter wrap the yarn bring it through both transfer it over now this is something i was told once and it seems to always be true but things in knitting don't tend to always be true but i'm going to tell you this because it seems like it's true a lot whichever stitch your needle goes in first when you're doing a decrease that stitch tends to be the one that's on top and it kind of controls the way it's leaning. So you can see these stitches are leaning that direction. So if I enter the stitch, so I'm entering this one first and I do my knit two together, then that is the one that's kind of on top that you see and it kind of controls the way that it leans. Now I'm gonna do a slip slip knit for contrast, slip as if to knit, Slip as if to knit. Take it through both. And see that one leans the other direction. It's the first stitch that is the one on top that you see. So I'm not sure how that helps you in the long run, but it's just kind of interesting to notice that. So if you're not sure which one you want to use and you have the choice, you can kind of decide which way you want that to lean. Okay, any questions about anything on the decreases? We just had requests to see them both again. So we'll let you get through your pearl row and do them all yeah. over again. These are, um, it's really important to see them several times and also do them several times. When you practice them, um, your hands really start to remember them. When I first learned this, I had to go back and watch a video for slip, slip, knit every time I had to do it um, until I ended up doing it enough times to remember. So don't worry about, you know, don't feel bad if you have to go back and refresh your memory. But you don't do them a lot. I mean, it's not like you're doing slip, slip, knit like a hundred times in each project, not usually. So that's why it's kind of hard to remember. All right, so I'm back to the knit side. I'm going to knit two so I can slip my marker consistently. Oh, scoot your hands back down a little bit, Darren. Down here? Thank you. Okay, so slip the marker. So we'll do SSK first. So slip as if to knit. Slip as if to knit, and then you take your left hand needle and you enter both of those stitches, but you're keeping your left hand needle on top. So the left hand needle is going to be on the same side closest to you. And then once you get to this point, this really much, it pretty much looks how things normally look. And then you just wrap your yarn and pull it through. So even though we got there kind of in a strange way, once we got there, it's kind of, it's not so unusual. Okay, so I'm gonna slip as if to knit, slip as if to knit, and then enter both stitches, wrap the yarn, bring it through. And you wanna make, don't be real nervous about it and, Tend to pull your yarn really tight you know try to keep it loose in your hand not too loose but keep it you know comfortable tension in your hand so i think i'm going to get rid of that one okay so now we're going to do knit two together i'm running out of stitches so knit two together you enter both stitches at the same time wrap your yarn bring it through both transfer it over 
So I've got one and two. I want to knit these two together. So I'm going to skip the first one, go to the second one. Oops. Enter both. Wrap your yarn, bring it through both, transfer it over, and I'll knit my last one. All right, how is that? How does everyone feel about that? Questions? I think we're all good. We had a couple questions for demonstrations on how to slip the first stitch in the row, which I answered in the chat. If we've got time at the end of the class, we might be able to demonstrate that. I'm not a big fan of that, though. I know a lot of people love it. I think it's good for projects like a scarf or a blanket where you're going to see the edge and you're not going to put a border on afterward. But if you're going to seam it, it's if not you're going to seam it, that. I would not do it. No, no. I don't usually do that. I know a lot of people love it. Yeah. Oh, we have a good question. Do you only increase or decrease on the knit side versus the purl side? Usually. Um, that, that's what we were talking about earlier. Usually the action um, of these stitches will take place on the knit side. You don't usually do them on the purl side. I would say for beginning patterns, you probably won't. But um, as Claire pointed out, and you know, lace or different things, you, you're gonna be forced to do them on the both sides because you have to um, control the way the lace is being shaped and formed. So if you didn't do them on the purl side, it could interfere with the shape of your lace. Yeah. I've um, done, I do purl two together and purl and I purl front and back of the loop sometimes. I've done that, but. Yeah, purl two together isn't too hard. I don't think I've ever done an SSK on the wrong side. An SSP. An SSP, yeah, I've never yes. done that. Yes, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. It's a lot of like contorting your needles and it's yeah, and doable, it's, but it's not I fun. I do easy stuff. Yes. Um, Holly had a question of review on the knit two together. You're entering from the left side of those two stitches and not the right side. Yeah, you would enter. Well, here, let me show you this. So if we're going to slip the first stitch, all you do, and then you slip it as if to purl. So you enter that stitch as if to purl, and then you just slip it right over. So it's that easy. Um, it's the, the crucial point is that you enter it the right way because if you enter it this way, you're going to twist that stitch. So slip it as if to purl, and as you're moving it over, just kind of watch it and see that it doesn't twist. And then if you're knitting two together, if you think about it when you're knitting, you always kind of enter the stitch from the left side of the stitch. So you would knit two together, you would go to the second one, enter it from the left side of the stitch, go through both, and then wrap it. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And then Merle has a question, which style of knitting pearls with the yarn in the back? I don't think there's any style of knitting that does that, to my knowledge. What's what? What was it? If you, when you're, if there's there a style of knitting that purls with a yarn in the back of the work? I think that's the Norwegian pearl. Ah, okay. I, I, knew, I used to know how to do the Norwegian pearl and it's a very handy trick, but I haven't kept practice with it, so I can't demonstrate it. But yeah, you, you, you it's really good if you're doing a lot of seed stitch or ribbing because you don't have to bring your work, your yarn back and forth, but there is a lot more like needle moving around. So it's kind of, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. You can decide what you like better. But yeah, research the Norwegian pearl and see if that's what you're thinking. Yeah. And then just a reminder on the two decreases that slip, slip, knit leans to the left and knit two together leans to the right. Anything else? Any questions about these? I think we probably better go through our mitten pattern very quickly and then we can see if we've got time at the end. See where we're gonna go to the end. I think everyone has, should have a handout or be able to get it. 
And in your handout, it gives diagrams and written instructions on how to do all the stitches we've learned today. Um, and then I love the YouTube videos and you can do that as well. So it's nice to read through the pattern to see what you're getting yourself into. So it's an easy plus. So it's not the easiest pattern in the world, but it's not too hard. Um, one size, which makes it easy. So now here's the question about materials. It calls for heartland, thick and quick and they made theirs in redwood, one skein. But Heartland Thick and Quick has been discontinued. So that's why we chose, because it's a really good knitting pattern, right? so you don't wanna just give it, a, you know, throw it away. So we use um, this hometown bonus bundle, which is very similar in size to the um, Heartland Thick and Quick. So it makes a great substitution. So you just wanna make sure that you're able to do that um, this yarn is a size six. Um, the other one was also a size six. And then you can double check the gauge information to see if it's similar. Yeah, the gauge information is right here. So just double check that if you're ever doing it on a different pattern. But just because you don't have the right yarn or maybe it's a vintage yarn or discontinued yarn, you can still do it. All right, so knitting needle size nine, knitting needle size 10. We're gonna need some stitch markers, a stitch holder or scrap yarn, and then large eyed blunt needles. So you might have most of this stuff. You might have to get some new needles. Um, frequently with something like a mitten, the needles are reduced into a smaller size and that makes the stitches smaller, which makes them tighter, um, which also makes them warmer. So if you're like, gonna make a snowball, you don't want the snow to come right through the mitten. So it does help with that. All right, so just a little notes, the mittens are worked flat and then seamed, and the smaller needle was used for the cuff. Um, so we're gonna go all through all that. Okay, so with the smaller needle and leaving a long tail, cast on 26 stitches. So that's easy, we all know how to do that. On the right side, we're gonna knit two, Purl two, repeat from the asterisk to the last two stitches ending with a knit two. So you always wanna pay attention and if you see an asterisk or any kind of punctuation, that means something's gonna happen. So you wanna make sure you're reading it carefully. And I think we all know how to do ribbing. I might be able to do a review of that quickly if we need to at the end. And then the next one, we're gonna purl two, knit two, repeat from the asterisk to the last two stitches ending with purl two. And then you're gonna repeat rows um, three through eight. Oh, I'm sorry, rows, one, rows three through eight will be one and two repeated. So you're just gonna keep going until you get to row eight. Then you're gonna begin the hand and you're gonna to change to the larger needle as you work the hand. And this is where we have some exciting things happening. So I'm gonna demonstrate some things here coming up. Um, the next row, we're going to knit 13. We're going to M1, K to the end of the row. At the end of the row, you will have 27 stitches. So that's, that's not too exciting. We're just making one extra stitch. Um, beginning with the wrong side row, you're going to purl and work and stop in that stitch for five rows. Okay, here's where the excitement starts. Row one on the right side, you're going to knit 13, place marker, M1, K1, M1, place marker, K to the end of the row. So that doesn't seem too crazy because now we have a few ideas of what that might mean. Um, and then it tells us row two and all wrong side rows, we're just gonna purl. So when you get to the purl side, it's like a little break for you. So let me show you So here's the next thing that I'm gonna be demonstrating. So we're not quite here yet, but I wanna show you what, what this is gonna end up looking like. So this is our ribbing. It said cast on, I think 26, um, and then we increase one stitch, and then we knit across. Again, I'm making a much smaller piece just for the sake of saving time. But as you're increasing each one of these you're doing your make one and your make one, which would start right here. 
and then you curl back and then you make one, make one, curl back, make one, make one. What happens is you're adding two stitches, one on each side. So you're increasing the number of stitches you have between your markers. So you start out, I think, with one or two between the markers. And then when you're finished, you'll have 12 between the markers. And you can see it creates this triangular shape in your work. And that's called a gusset. And a gusset is also used in sewing where it needs to add extra space or extra room or to create shaping. So this is a gusset that we've added in here and that's gonna make room for our thumb. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're almost to the point where that'll be important. So beginning the hand. Okay, so here we're gonna do the shape, the thumb gusset. And this is where we knit 13 and place marker, purl on all the wrong side rows knit to the marker, slip the marker, make one, knit to the next marker. So you're gonna knit clear up against that next marker. You're gonna make one, you're gonna slip the marker and then knit to the end of the row. So you're gonna repeat, repeat row three and every time you repeat it, you're gonna be adding two stitches to your gusset and you're always gonna be on the wrong side, just purling, okay? So does that make sense? How you're gonna create, end up creating this gusset? Any questions about that? I think we're good on the gusset shaping. And one thing, just like a little point to help you remember, your, your increases are always gonna be inside this little place, so you, make sure you're always doing it on the inside of each one of these stitch markers. It just kind of helps you remember where you are. Like you don't want to ever be doing them outside of that. Okay, so that's creating the gusset. Okay, so this is an exciting part right here. So the next row, you're gonna to knit to the marker, remove the marker, you're gonna slip the next 11 stitches onto a stitch holder, remove the next marker and knit to the end of the row. So that sounds, <clears throat> sounds a little crazy, but I'm gonna show you how easy it actually is. And once you see it, you'll, you'll feel good and comfortable about it. So you're gonna, <clears throat> knit to your marker and you'll have more stitches than this. Yours won't look quite like this. So knit to the marker, remove one, remove the marker, slip the next 11 stitches onto a holder. Now what I like to do instead of a stitch holder, I like to use the scrap yarn solution. So you just take a large eyed blunt needle, put some scrap yarn on it. <clears throat> you wanna make sure it's of similar gauge. And you also wanna make sure that it's not gonna leave a lot of lint behind. So if I were really making mittens, I might choose like a lighter one, like maybe a light blue or something, but I think this will be fine. Um, and for, re for practicing, it'll be, it doesn't matter at all. What can happen is, you can leave, like if you were to use bright red or something, you could leave lint behind on each one of those stitches and it could show in your finished work. Okay, so as you can see, all I'm doing is I'm entering, I'm slipping each stitch as if to purl onto my needle. You don't wanna do it as if to knit or you'll twist each one. So you're slipping each one on to your needle one at a time or two at a time, however you like. Remove the marker. And then you're gonna pull that through. And the reason I like <clears throat> to use scrap yarn instead of a marker, I'm sorry, instead of a stitch holder, the stitch holders are kind of like a big safety pin and they're stiff and rigid. And they, they don't, they're not flexible in your hand and sometimes they can get in the way. Okay, so you wanna give yourself like a nice, you don't want to tie this down really tight. 
You do want to tie, however, very secure knots. So you're going to tie a really tight knot, but you're going to give yourself plenty of slack in that knot so that later on you'll easily be able to see what you're doing. Without. And just trim off any excess to get that out of the way. So any questions about that? That's pretty straightforward. You just slip it on and then you just skip right over this like, like they never happen. You want to tuck that in there. All right, so, and then it says knit to the end. So you're going to bring these two together, and then you're just going to knit to the end. You have to find your working yarn. So knit to the end. I'm not knitting that in with it. All right, I've got my scrap yarn. I'll twist it around my needle. So when you knit that first stitch, you want to pull it a little tight to just kind of bring those two sides together. So we're not making, doing anything crazy. We're just pulling it a little more snug. And then you knit all the way across to the end, doing whatever it instructs you to do. And that is that. So I'm going to curl back across just to show you what to do, just because sometimes it might seem there's nothing to show. That's what I want to show you, basically. Is really, there's nothing to show. So you curl back across. Sometimes we feel like, oh, there's going to be some crazy thing I have to do where I slip those and kind of join them together. So this will join them together for us. You know, I'm getting right into there, right where. So I might want to pull it just a little more snug, just, just a little snug to make sure it's being put together nicely. But you see there's nothing fancy going on there. You just purl back across, living your life just as normal. Okay. And so what you have here, that is the beginning of your thumb. That is the thumb gusset. So if this were like a real mitten, you can see how that creates the shape that would fit my thumb. Does it make sense? Look good? Okay, so we can move on to the next bit then. All right, so once we've slipped the thumb onto the scrap yarn, right here, okay, so we did that one. So we're gonna beginning with the wrong side, which is the pearl row. We're gonna work in stockinette stitch for 26 we're going to across the 26 stitches that remain on your needle for about four inches or 10 centimeters past the stitch holder. So right where you separated for the thumb, ending with a right side row, which means just having finished a right side row as the last stitch that you worked. Now, one thing I do like to point out here is maybe you have a friend that has tiny little hands and you don't want to go four inches, maybe three inches, maybe two and a half inches are better for this person. Or maybe you have a friend that has very large hands and you might want to go five or six inches. So this is where you can kind of alter the pattern real easily without getting into any trouble, um, just making sure that you're making it for the right person. You know, you want it to fit nicely. That's the best part about knitting is you can um, make things kind of custom for people that maybe they have a hard time finding mittens or gloves that work. So once you've decided how far you're gonna go with that, we're gonna shape the top of the mitten. So on the right side, we're gonna knit one, SSK, knit to three stitches before the marker, K2 together, knit one. Wait a minute, I skipped this up here. So, okay, I started this one, but then I didn't read it all the way through, which could be a big mistake if you do that while you're working. Um, 
about four inches past the stitch holder on the right side. It is stained up post. Okay, so I didn't place the markers as it was instructing because I wasn't really following the pattern. So it's when it's telling you to place the markers, just make sure you get them placed correctly. But I was trying to save time so I kind of skipped over that. So shaping the top of the mitten, we're going to SSK and knit two together. So on the right side. So starting on the right side, yeah, I didn't want to have to knit like the entire mittens in the hour and have you watch me purl back because that's not exciting. So we're going to SSK. So you can see here's my thumb gusset. So I left that behind. So SSK. And then knit, you're going to knit all the way across until you get to the marker that it will instruct you to place and you'll put that in the right place. And then you'll knit two together and then you'll just follow these instructions as they go. You have more than one decrease set of one, more than one set of decreases in each row. But that's pretty much how you're going to be doing it. Not splitting your yarn as I just did. And then knit the last one. So I just wanted to demonstrate how this is going to kind of look as you're going. Okay, so then you're going to start shaping the mitten and you can see my knit two together. You can see how they're leaning this direction and that it gives you a nice line and then the SSK kind of leaning that direction and it gives you a nice line. So I did quite a few of them in advance so that I could show you how it looks. And then you're going to keep going until you have a certain number of stitches at the top. Until you have eight stitches left at the top. So you're going to keep following these instructions until there's eight stitches left at the top. And then I'm going to show you what to do from there. All right, so here, this, this is the mitten that's knitted. This is the entire mitten knitted clear out. So I want you to see how that looks. So here's the thumb. Um, I actually knitted this thumb already, so, but I, I will show you how to knit the thumb. I have a sample that I can put it on for you. So you can see the mitten is shaped like this. It's going up to a point. This is the shaping for the other side. So if you fold it in half, that looks a lot like a mitten, right? So what we're going to do is it, it's going to have us... Um, Use this. We're going to use a. Uh, my yarn's kind of really ratty, so what I'm going to do is wrap it in a piece of paper. And bring that through like this. So that it, sometimes that's a nice way to help you thread your needle if the yarn is overly fuzzy or kind of fraying apart. Okay. I'm going to so break gonna... in here. And just tell, since it is past five now, if anybody needs oh. to run, just a reminder that the recording of this class will be available tomorrow at michaels.com slash classes. So you can watch it over and over again as much as you need to. Um, if anyone needs the handout, I'm going to pop it into the chat a couple more times before the end of class. And I'm going to do it now in case you need to download and run. Okay, I thought we were going to finish early, but... No, you, you just have too many tips to give out, Darren. There's a lot. I do like to give out a good tip. So <laughs> what you do then is it's going to instruct you to put your last stitches on. Um, you're going to thread this through. So you're going to use your tail, put it on a darning needle, and then thread that through all of your last working stitches. And then you're going to pull that tight to gather it really tight 
and then you're going to seam this edge and have a nice closed edge. And then the last thing that we need to go over is how do we deal with this thumb? Okay. So the main thing you want to remember is that these stitches are live. And if you to just if you take them off the holder or just remove them from the yarn, they will unravel. So I usually don't take them off until the very last step. So you just enter these stitches this way. And you want to position them so that when it's time to start knitting, you are actually on the knit side. So this is my left hand. And as I'm starting to knit, I'll go through here. You just go through here. And you don't even have a working yarn. So you just add your working yarn and then you will knit them just directly over to the next needle. Now what can happen sometimes if you're not paying attention, if you enter the needle this direction and point it that way, and then you hold your needle to knit, you might be looking at purl stitches. And if you do that, that's fine, but make sure you start with purl stitches. So whatever stitches you're looking at, that's the kind you're gonna make. But technically, you should be doing knit stitches. And so you knit that all the way across, removing you know, from one needle to the next. I like to leave my scrap yarn in there until I'm finished because if I make a mistake and I have to rip it out, then that scrap yarn will be there as a lifeline. And it's also a nice place to measure from. So if you're measuring from the scrap yarn, it gives you a very distinct like starting point. So that's really all you do. You pick up that, you pick up those live stitches and you knit them and you're going to follow the instructions and it's going to have you knit a couple of rows and then start your decreases which is very fast on the thumb you don't want to knit your scrap yarn into your work i'm going to leave it because it's just practice and then see if your needle falls out your scrap yarn is still there and then you just keep going. So it's actually quite simple. Any questions about picking up that thumb gusset? And then just cut your scrap yarn and take it out whenever you're ready. You can do it now or you can wait till you're finished. Any questions? And then you would just keep going, work in a stockinette stitch until it's the proper measurement. And again, you can adjust that measurement to suit your thumb or the thumb of the person you're making it for, depending on how big of hands they have. So that's pretty much it. Any, any questions or any, anything I think else? Everyone appreciated the tip about using the scrap yarn rather than that hard stitch holder. So you can still try on the mitten as you go. It's a yes, great it's my tip. Favorite. Yes. yes, yes. And just to clarify, when you start knitting those thumb stitches again, what yarn are you using? Oh, um, you're just using the same yarn, of course, that you've been knitting with. Um, you'll just rejoin a working yarn. So you would have, by then you would have cut the working yarn that you were using when you're knitting the top of the mitten. And then you just rejoin that same working yarn to the thumb and, it, and then you'll just start from there. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. And just a reminder again that this recording will be available tomorrow at michaels.com slash classes. I'm gonna put the handout in the chat one more time. And then if you want to keep hanging out with Darren and I on Monday afternoon, you can join us next week for Knitting 104, which will cover how to fix some common knitting mistakes that you might run across. And that'll be at the same time, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's a real fun class. Yes. All right. I was say, we're almost 10 minutes over now so i think we'll let everybody run Sorry. and get your evening started but thanks for hanging out with us thanks for coming to class